Is this thing on? Is that the phone? Hello? Jody Whittaker, how is it going? I'm a big fan, Jody. Your performance on Broadchurch really made me understand what a woman who loses their child in such devastating circumstances must feel. I'd love to meet you. What? You're not Jody Whittaker. You're Roseanne Barr. Is this thing on? Welcome back to Big Mouth and fancy seeing you here in June. I very welcome my friends and especially my enemies coming. Sit down, no touching. I don't do the touching. And welcome to Wednesday's edition of the Doctor Who Daily. Now, very shortly, I'm going to be reading you a brand new piece of Doctor Who fiction, very kindly written by the brilliant Pete McTeague, who actually is probably one of, one of the Doctor Who fans' favourite writers in the Chris Chibnall era. But first, I'm going to do my due diligence because it's been a great time for Doctor Who fans during this lockdown. I know great time and lockdown don't normally mix, but we've had these brilliant tweet-alongs watching episodes like The Day of the Doctor, Rose, and all um, kind of, not kind of, but all organised by the brilliant Emily Rossina. And um, we've got another one on Friday, of course, which will be a tweet along for the 11th hour. Stephen Moffat is involved. He's found a scene, or he's looking for a scene, according to his Instagram, that he cut, that he regrets cutting. He will be showing it to us on Friday. So that's the tweet along, hashtag fish custard, if I remember rightly. But that's not it. That's not it. Because John Barrowman, tomorrow night, 8 o'clock UK time, 10 o'clock here in Cyprus, will be tweeting along with the Torchwood Season 1 episode, Captain Jack Harkness. One of my best episodes. This is the episode where we finally find out that Captain Jack Harkness isn't Captain Jack Harkness. And he stole the, uh, he stole the name from a World War II soldier that he was actually also in love with. Now, this is brilliant. Now, I will talk about this episode and review this episode after we see it. I think probably on Friday's Doctor Who Daily. Um, but one of the things that I like with what Russell T Davies did with this character is he shadowed the Doctor. He uses a fake name. The Doctor isn't the Doctor's name. He has a secret name. Captain Jack Harkness, his name, isn't Captain Jack Harkness. He's lying. He does. I don't know if he forgot his name. I can't remember now. But literally, Captain Jack Harkness isn't his name. So the parallels with the Doctor are amazing. And as I say... I will be talking more about that episode on Friday. But I just want to say one thing about the Russell T Davies era before we re read um, this story by Pete McTeague. And by the way, I haven't read the story. I want it fresh in my mind so we can do it together. I was brought up in a very homophobic, transphobic um, background. I was brought up by a homophobic parents basically so children's minds are like a sponge we soak in the love but we soak in the hate as well so you end up believing the nonsense that your parents teach you whether it's hateful nonsense or silly nonsense or whatever just think about this there's a culture war going on right now with representation casting of people of color of minorities things like that right russell t davies cast a gay actor to play a character who would literally shag anyone with a heartbeat, right? And it's beautiful. And I still remember the moment when Captain Jack kisses the ninth doctor, Christopher Eccleston's doctor. Now, in, a, in the past, if I saw a man kissing a man, I would have had a different negative reaction. But that's the moment where I revolutionary changed my thinking. I cried when I saw that scene. Russell T Davies managed to educate me, to change my heart, to change my soul, to change my mind. TV is important. It can educate us. It doesn't have to be accused of being preachy. When these things are done the right way, but you can add mythology and entertainment to these things, they really, really work. Anyway, let's read this story. Sit back, grab your popcorn, and let's imagine the Doctor Who things just played na 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 written by Pete McTeague. The story is called Press Play. The Doctor was feeling lonely. 
Most of the time she could suppress those feelings and distract herself by saving a planet, averting a war or emergency, deep freezing, cry crinoid hatchings. But not today. Today was different. Today she sat on the steps of the TARDIS console, remunching her last custard cream, watching glooming control crystal rise to fall, rise and fall, rise and fall. While her space time machine was in Arton 2 recharge mode, the doctor couldn't allow anyone else on board, especially humans. The Artron pulses played havoc with their DNA. She guiltily remembered that time with David Bowie when his left pupil permanently dilated. The doctor sighed, oh, savouring her final mouthful of biscuit. Her brain was still working 13 million to the dozen in the background, backing up like the biggest and best hard drive in the universe, but it felt dulled and distant. If Mardi was an emotion, she was feeling it. Then the TARDIS beeped, beeped, a friendly, quirky little sound she hadn't heard before. It was like it knew what she was thinking, which of course it secretly did. Curious, the doctor scrambled to her feet and in response, a jet of steam hissed out of the console. Hissed. Projected onto the steam was a line of old Gallifreyan text. You have one unread message. What message? The doctor blurted out loud. Since when did you start taking messages? Since ages ago, the TARDIS replied in a petulant series of hums and whistles. Well, aren't you chatty? What, what, what were you last September? Where were you last September when I ran out of monologues? Just read the message. The TARDIS seemed to say the doctor jabbed a button on the console, then turned as a hologram fizzed into life. She felt a surge of emotion as she start, stared into the face before her. The girl was in her mid teens with a shock of jet black hair, a stripped top and eyes twinkling with mischief. The sight of her cracked the doctor's dark mood like an egg. Hello, grandfather, said the hologram. What? Wow. Right, okay, let's carry on. Hello, gran grandfather, said the hologram. The doctor's voice caught in her throat. Hello, Susan, she finally replied. This was clearly a recording made when her granddaughter was still a teenager, when they were traveling together so many lifetimes ago. Susan's image crackled as she continued talking, I've built a message bank and retrieval system into the TARDIS data core for a rainy day in case you need cheering up. I know what you're like when you get bored or lonely. What am I like? Snapped the doctor defensively. Grumpy, Susan replied. The doctor clutched her braces and frowned. I know nothing lost. I know nothing lost forever. Susan continued, and that eventually we'll have to say goodbye. But when that day comes, I want to leave you with some memories of our time together. The doctor's eyes misted over. There was a lump in her throat. I know how she feels. Not, not just of me, but of future friends, future times and places. I've activated the TARDIS record mode, record mode telepathically linked to your data extract. So if, you ever, if you're ever feeling bored or lonely or sad, all you have to do is access the data bank and retrieve a favorite memory. It will keep on recording until you tell it to stop. All your adventures, all your stories won't go to waste. They'll always be here waiting for you like an archive alive for, en for eternity. Stunned, the doctor watched a stream of text appearing on the screen. Old adventures logged in, long list that seemingly scrolled forever. Some of the early ones might have gaps. Sorry about that. You know what the TARDIS is like with integrating new systems? The TARDIS grumbled disapprovingly. Anyway, I'd better go. Oh, I'll be late for school. I hope the message gets to you someday when you need it the most. With a final smile, Susan's image flickered, then evaporated. The doctor stared at the empty space for a very long time, seconds at least. Then she snapped into action, scrolling through the endless list of titles, unsure where to begin. Crisis on Poosh, Genesis of the Daleks, the attack of the postman, the time lash. 
10,000 BC, AKM, AKA, an, an earthly child, AKA, one in the Stone Age. Intelligent labeling systems, bit random, thought the doctor. Let me start again. Intelligent labeling systems, bit random, thought the doctor. Her finger hovering over the activation button. Finally, she made her selection and pressed play. The TARDIS console pinged again. Result, the custard creams have been replenished. The doctor eagerly plucked one from the dispenser and settled back to watch hazy images from on the screen. As she chewed, she decided she'd FaceTime Graham Ryan and Yaz later. But for now, she was happily distracted with the gift that Susan had left behind, an endless supply of stories, a comfort blanket of fond memories and old friends, and a reminder that she was never alone. Pete McTeague, Pete McTeague, my friend, you should be running Doctor Who. That was freaking well beautiful. Beautiful, please comment down below. I could barely read it, as you could probably notice. My eyes were so cloudy and emotional. This is no BS. That was amazing. That was freaking amazing. This man should be running Doctor Who. This man understands the Doctor. It was like a Russell T. Davies show. Like a Stephen Moffat show. This was beautiful. This is what we haven't had, Chris. We are not getting at you. We're not criticising you to be mean or horrible or because we're sexists or racists. I know that Jodie is a talented actor, but you haven't given her enough food and drink and meat to eat. And actors are desperate for that, as Christopher, uh, sorry, as Russell T Davies once said about David Tennant's doctor. You haven't given our doctor enough of that. This is a beautiful story, a beautiful story. It refers to a character we love, a character that was part of the Doctor's life, her granddaughter, right? It was beautiful, but it was clever because she doesn't come back. She hasn't been regenerated. It's a recording. It's clever. It's smart. This is a beautiful story, Pete McTeague. You have done a beautiful thing. And I'm, gonna, I'm about to go and tweet you and show you my appreciation. But for me, for me... Pete McTeague should immediately be appointed as the showrunner of Doctor Who. And if not that, at least joint executive producer with Chris Chibnall. You could learn a lot from Pete. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory fashion. You really could. Now, with everything going on, it seems that they are desperate to backtrack. The, the reaction to the Timeless Children was so negative. And I think instead of kind of, kind of you know, going full circle and saying, this is what we're doing, like your Olympic. They know the numbers are falling. The numbers are still good numbers, but they're not good enough. And when something's going down instead of going up or sticking, that is a problem in this game. So they're trying the positivity game. This is positive. This is beautiful. Pete McTeague for immediate new showrunner of Doctor Who. Comment down below, like, share and subscribe. I'll be back tomorrow with even more Doctor Who Daily. Wow. I'm a mess.